The next speaker is Paul Keller, a copyright policy advisor and vice chair, vice chair of Knowledge Land, which is an Amsterdam-based think tank focused on innovation in the knowledge economy. First of all, of course, thanks to the organizers and uh, uh, for, for this opportunity to speak to all of you. Um, I learned a very interesting thing in the presentation, two presentations ago, that my government actually um, bought two, um, two vaccines for me to prevent me from the flu that didn't um, prevent me from getting the flu on the way over here. So I'm feeling a bit um, limited today, but I hope I make it through this talk. Um, also, always a, a little bit strange to, 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 to swift this, this quickly from, from issues um, around medicine, access to medicine, to something as access to culture. But anyway, it's the long arc presentation, and I've um, been asked to um, talk about access to culture um, in the long arc, and my long arc is um, a little bit younger. Um, I can do this myself, right? Um, except. Um, so, and this starts with a, a, a project which um, we, my organization, Kennisland, has been involved in or become involved in around 2004, 2005. So it's not totally 10 years, it's more like seven years that we've been busy on this. And this was the realization that we have a lot of cultural heritage material, which is mainly audiovisual material, lots of it on film, which was decaying. It's actually nitrate-based film, and it's um, in, stored in bunkers, like the one you see over there. And this stuff is rotting away. It's becoming dangerous. It's becoming more expensive to, to, um, to keep, but also more expensive to restore and to digitize. And in around 2004, 2005, the Dutch government actually had an idea to, to think, like, what was a fairly rich times in that, uh, around that time, to set up a massive program uh, 150 million euros at that time to restore the audiovisual heritage material of the Netherlands. And the idea was basically to bring stuff like this, which is actual film, nitrate-based film material, but also stuff like this, which is um, tapes, videotapes in the Institute for Sound and Vision, which is the archive of the broadcasting organizations in the Netherlands, and transform it into this and this which is basically digital storage robots which have high definition files of this video material which are available on demand. Now this was one part of this project, or one intention of this project was to actually restore all this material and to make sure that it doesn't decay and that it becomes available, that it be saved. But it also, and this is where it becomes kind of interesting and where this, this, um, this project connects with what we're talking about here, is that it says here, and this is an English translation from the Dutch text, so it's not that, uh, that good, that the starting point of this project is the broad availability of the audiovisual material for everybody. Now, this, from my perspective nowadays, this is a citation from the project plan, which was written by leading researchers, um, people in my organization, but also the government ministries involved were in this. And from my perspective, this sounds, this is something written in 2005 or end of 2004, for context also, keep in mind this is before YouTube. Um, that's how fast we're moving these days. But it also sounds incredibly naive where you say like, and we have, apart from some copyright issues, um, we'll make it available for everyone for free. Um, this is not exactly how this has turned out to be. If we look, and these are figures from earlier this year, is material uh, digitized by the Institute for Sound and Vision, which is the, as I mentioned, the, um, the institute which um, collects the material from all the public broadcasters. They have um, digitized almost 100,000 hours of film and video, of which a mere 17,000 hours are available for educational users, and a tiny, not even a thousand hours of these are available for everyone for free. Um, so while we started this project saying like, and again, this is from the perspective of 2005 basically, saying like the big challenge here is going to be the technical digitization um, that hadn't been done on that scale by public, at least by public sector entities at that time, and there's very few projects of this scale at the moment, um, turns out that the digitization goes fine. Um, it's the access to the material which is much more difficult to realize. Like if you um, take the material by the iFilm Institute, which is now a different metric, it's not ours, but it's works, and they digitize mainly films. Um, it's much fewer films, but the 
distribution again shows you like you have a massive amount of material digitized, a far smaller amount which is um, which has been cleared for copyright in these reasons this is material which has been ascertained to be in the public domain or which are often works or which is something they managed to actually got a deal with the people owning the rights in it and still a even smaller amount of that is available to everyone most of the time having that cleared doesn't mean that you actually got permission to make it available for free on the internet for everyone or even against payment for everyone on the internet it just means it's been cleared and we know who the rights holders are so this is a completely publicly funded um, project which comes um, which deals with material which has before that been preserved by public institutions which have always been publicly funded in the case of the broadcasters or the broadcasters are public so we're dealing with public money and everybody has the intention here to make that material available and it doesn't work um, so what have we done in before when we look at the long arc and this is maybe like also a little bit a, a reflection on the role of people who've like 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 me and others in this project who've looked at it as an opportunity to actually do something positive with copyright in this context we've in the first time we've done like we've created fig leaf projects for ourselves we have something which we are and we were incredibly proud about that we worked out something called open images in this project which is all free all creative commons licensed it's wikimedia compatible codex that the video is in the back end runs an open source software and something and it contains at the moment 2290 clips of three minutes and this comes out of the repertoire of the night of the hundred thousand hours which we have digitized we've done um, there's there's bigger ones here this is and I always have a certain joy in these presentations to actually use Mickey Mouse as a quotation uh, or to illustrate a point but this is um, a Italian film archive called Cinecitta Luce who've partnered with Google and they are putting about 30,000 hours of material online at the moment on their YouTube channel which is much bigger amount which is possible because Cina Cita Luce is basically the it's the rights holder and the archive in the same place and they can actually make this material available um, we have done stuff like working on what we've heard here very reactive work if you want we've done worked very hard in the European context to defend ideas of the public domain for example with Europeana the public domain charter which has made its way into certain policies of the European Union by now into um, funding schemes and such which establishes the idea that by mere digitization of a cultural artifact you can't create new exclusive rights over that which is of course a very reactive thing that should have been obvious in the uh, 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 from the start we've also done um, a little bit maybe maybe less reactive like we've I think we've so seen this issue coming earlier than most of the people and we went in and said we need to create something which actually ensures that the metadata generated by these cultural institutions remains free that wasn't so much a fight that was more trying to establish norms before anybody else established norms but still this of course brings us in a situation where these public institutions which um, in, in Europe and in many other parts of the world but especially in Europe we have a, 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 a rich history of public museums public archives public libraries which um, function very well or used to function very well in the analog realm um, which are very strangely amputated in the digital realm if you want because they can focus what they can do is they can make available material for which they have the rights themselves by their own nature they almost never have the rights in the material because they collect from others they can do for material which is in the public domain which as we know is like around 150 years back from us if we really want so film archives photography pretty much forget about public domain material um, or it's incredibly difficult to to determine which material of that is in the public domain um, and you can have the metadata but the the big bulk of the material the third party rights um, they are you can't do anything you can go in a museum and you can look at stuff regardless of copyright status but museums can't operate um, websites um, without basically obtaining licenses from copyright holders these days this is interesting thing if you go my my hometown Amsterdam if you uh, if you if you compare the two websites of the two leading museums the Rijksmuseum which has a 
basically golden age um, uh, uh, collection of, of 17th century uh, art and the Stedelijk Museum which is the, the, the modern art museum. The one website is fantastic and the other website sucks and has lots of like gr tiny little gray boxes that say like for copyright reasons we can't show this stuff to you. And these are two institutions which we both fund as the public with exactly the same intentions. We want to share this material, make it available, make it to be usable in your educational context and in the one place that the, we, we pour money and resources in it where we can do something with this in the digital realm and in the other case we can't. Um, so where do we go from here? Um, one interesting thing, again my, 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 my frame of reference is Europe, is the, the public sector information directive which is currently negotiated between Parliament and um, the Commission in, in Europe and it, um, one of the changes proposed to that which will very likely also end up in the final negotiated thing is the exclusion of the public sector, of, of the definition of what is public sector information to information which is held by publicly accessible museums, libraries and archives, memory institutions if they want. Um, surprisingly or not surprisingly, we're seeing actually we've seen a lot of lobbying by these very organizations against this move. They don't want to be classified as public institutions for whatever reason because the public sector information directive comes with an obligation to make available that public sector information under non-discriminatory terms to the public. And they apparently see themselves more as market players who would, who would like to be under no such obligation and compete in the market against the Googles and Facebooks and other content providers of this world, which is, in my eyes, extremely short-sighted. Um, they will be included in this, but only with the material where there's no third-party copyrights on it. So this doesn't solve anything, but it's an important first step of defining actually saying these are public institutions and they need to play by different norms and different rules than private institutions do. That privilege which you give them and that obligations you put on them will give you the opportunity to maybe carve out different roles when it comes to copyright to them. If they would have been left out here, there's no reason to um, or, or no justification for treating them any different from, from say, Google. Um, and so this is basically a very interesting point in time where we are at the moment in this discussion. So far for all these seven years when I've worked on this, like the discussions have been very much like what is a maximum realistic thing which we can achieve in this, in this sector. And it's always been hinged on some kind of licensing based solution. In Europe, mainly we're thinking about extended collective licensing type approaches to that where you, um, where you where you grant or extend the rights of a collecting society or some other body, body in order to give um, licenses for material which isn't represented. That's been like the way out best case scenario for a long time. We're moving closer to that. Interestingly, like um, currently if you talk to policy makers, especially those influenced from the, from the cultural ministers, uh, ministries, from the people charged with generating access, they see this long arc which I've described as some kind of learning curve as an aberration in their thing where they think we've been stupid. We haven't dealt with the problem which is the main problem at the beginning. We've been toying around for this six, seven years not knowing anything about how copyright interacts with that and we should properly fix copyright. And if you talk through with people, like a lot of people, you suddenly see um, the possibility of exceptions and limitations for online use by cultural institutions in Europe picking up. At the other time, um, and, and, and this is like where it becomes dangerous here and where it becomes very contentious is that you see like the cultural sector is still very much stuck in this idea nothing will ever change and the best thing which we might get is a licensing based solution and at this moment we're seeing these licensing based solutions basically have already become in anticipation of this turnover to maybe a real discussion about limitations and exceptions um, the, the kind of like the contingency strategy, the containment strategy of the rights holders representatives. So we are arguing for something because of some kind of like information travels much slower in these um, cultural bureaucracies than it does within the networks of the rights holders. Um, we're being outpaced here and I would argue we have, and you're the wrong people to argue to this, so I should argue to other people, that there's a tremendous opportunity here at the moment 
um, that we all need to work on to sensi like, like, like to sensitize the, the, the cultural heritage institutions, policy makers, to actually go one step further and argue for a proper solution to the problem I tried to outline. Thank you very much for your attention.